Hello. <laughs> Hello, heathens. Uh, welcome back to class. <laughs> so good to virtually see you all. Uh, make yourselves at home. <laughs> oh my goodness. Hi, Eva. Hi, Patty. Ah! I wish I could hug you guys. I wish we were all in the room together with the art on the walls, hanging out, doing the thing. We'll just have to go to the virtual temple today for class. Hi, Caitlin! <laughs> Yay! Uh, if this is your first time to class, uh, we will get started here in just a few. Hi, Lark! Yay! Yay! Come on! Oh my god! All the witches have arrived! Oh, it's so good. It's so good. <laughs> um, if this is your first time uh, hanging out for one of these classes, which it's not for any of you, but if you happen to be watching this later on, <laughs> uh, please go grab something to drink, maybe a snack, uh, a journal, maybe some art supplies, your tarot deck, your natal chart. Um, are all things that you might want to work with while you are listening to this information and whatever it is that we're going to end up doing today. <laughs> uh, full disclosure, I'm in a mood. It's been a week. It's been more than a week. Um, and, uh, and so I, I don't know how class is going to go tonight. I have a normal class prepared and I'm kind of feeling like other things may want to come up to the surface tonight. So... We're going to play it by ear. <laughs> it may be, yeah, we, we'll, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> Aries rising, so, you know, <laughs> chaos wizard before anything else. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Are you all ready for spring? Or are you like, oh, my God, I'm not done yet. I'm not ready for spring. What's it feeling like? What kind of movie are we talking about? It's... It, uh, I, hmm. <laughs> it's been a tough week. Um, so, uh, so I'm in an interesting mood. <laughs> We're along for the ride. Cool. <laughs> I mean, you know, mischievous is always in the mix. <laughs> yeah, Patty, flowing with it. Absolutely. There's not much else we can do sometimes when it gets like, you know, weird. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, here we go. <laughs> yeah, body ready, mind not so much, right? <laughs> uh, I feel like, I think I'm the opposite right now. I think I am definitely, my mind is like, let's go, let's say yes to everything that's ever been possibly conceived. And my body is like, I want to stretch and sleep for another year and a half. Is that cool? Like, <laughs> And then my mind is like, that's actually not a bad idea. You know what? Like, these ideas will be here when we get back. Let's just, <laughs> let's not worry about it for a while. <laughs> Sipping on some hot peppermint tea. Uh, I always work with this herb when I'm doing these lectures because... It is, hi, mystery tea. This is not a mystery tea. I know what this tea is. This is peppermint tea. That is a mystery tea. <laughs> um, I love drinking uh, peppermint because I find it to be really mentally stimulating, but not in a caffeine way, not in a stimulant way. I don't know. But a lot of other witches like working with this as a grounding herb. And I was like, I wonder if that's what it is so that I can like actually come down and talk about things. <laughs> New baby chicks. Ah, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, baby animals at this time of year. I want to like press all of them directly to my face. Oh my God. And so many starts, right? I know. I don't have any starts going. I don't have any starts going. I've been too freaking busy to do cool stuff. My plants, however, are like... I think they're going to take me in the night. I'm fine with it, honestly. I'm totally fine with it. <laughs> like, death by pothos? Great. <laughs> Wonderful. 
Uh, it's 6.07. All right, we fucked around long enough. Okay, snap two. Right. <laughs> Remember in class, <laughs> I would yell at you guys and get mad. <laughs> <laughs> it'll happen again the spankings will flow once again soon enough in the meanwhile covid is gonna do what it fucking does but you know um okay let us begin to begin shall we um tonight we are going to be talking about ostara and other stuff associated with uh, spring equinox. Um, welcome, my name is Megan Angus, <laughs> and this is the Wheel of the Year series. I've been teaching this series since 2015, every six weeks, more or less, <laughs> since 2015. Um, and uh, this series is intended as um, a bunch of different things. <laughs> that laund That's a laundry list that kind of changes over time. But mostly what I'm trying to do with these classes is connect science and spirituality for pagans um, and show pagans that our pagan history and our pagan uh, traditions are rooted in universal practices, some of which go back tens or 50 or even 100,000 years or more. Um, and also, uh, taking a look at and becoming aware of uh, all of the other uh, spiritual practices, philosophical practices, uh, cultural traditions around the planet, past and present, um, that have also witnessed these uh, celebrations, these changings of the seasons and all of that good stuff that we do with the Sabbaths. Uh, you know, and it's not to say that all of these things are exactly the same, um, and it's also not to say that one culture necessarily got the idea from another or didn't. <laughs> That's what there's a lot of conjecture, a lot of argument, a lot of, you know, territorial pissings around that kind of stuff. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, it's, it's my belief that we share a lot more uh, than we don't. Um, and even when you have uh, two cultures who came up with the same practices, independently, I think that is wildly fascinating as much as when a, a culture inherits traditions from another culture. Um, I, I think it's just sort of the, the beautiful tapestry of, of humanity and our, try, our attempt to understand what this is, life and reality and all of it. So uh, tonight we are going to be talking about Ostara and Spring Equinox within the scope of that conversation. So let's get into it. Okay. Um, uh, they got the rest of the spiel, I guess I should say, before we actually get into this. Um, I teach these classes every six weeks, Wheel of the Year. You can find me at MeganAngus.com. Uh, I also have a weekly, mostly, uh, podcast called Spinning the Wheel. I also teach classes on tarot. I do private tarot mentorships um, and uh, teach classes on paganism, witchcraft, and other cool stuff. I have an irregular newsletter that's free that you can sign up for through my website. And I also have a Patreon if you want to work more deeply with this work, uh, this and tarot. Um, I offer uh, extra materials, exclusive stuff, behind the scenes stuff there. Um, oftentimes you'll get my research and my writings a year before the rest of the world does. Um, and... Uh, we also do a monthly tarot circle uh, through Patreon, which is really fun. Um, there is a workbook and a calendar for this class in the Patreon bag of holding, uh, and that is available for folks that are subbed at the $9 level and higher. Um, you can get the workbook for this class that I will be referring to, as well as the seven-ish week calendar, because uh, a star season is a little shorter. Um, and other fascinating and incredible things. Uh, this month, the patrons haven't seen it yet. You guys haven't seen this yet, but, because I'm just about to upload it. Um, I have some wallpapers for you guys, and I have some digital spells for you guys to work with. I have a, um, I guess it's kind of a visual meditation for you guys, a piece of artwork that I did uh, that is intended to be uh, freaky <laughs> and mess with you. So <laughs> in the best of ways, of course. Um, but stuff like that, playlists and things. Um, yeah. Uh, I really truly appreciate the support of my patrons, uh, because, um, 
well, for a lot of reasons. And it's very confirming and it's really, really cool. And um, the community that we are creating in that place is is really special. I'm excited about the work that we're doing together. And uh, the last Tarot Circle that we had was really incredible. I'm looking forward to the next one. Um, so yeah, uh, join me there if you want more of this. <laughs> It's not an NFT. It is not an NFT. However, I'm going to say something, something, something. NFTs for the uh, algorithms. <laughs> because I, I do uh, put captions on these videos. So <laughs> give me the clicks, bitches. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Yes, yes. Gathering season fall. Yep, absolutely. And we are, isn't it fun and weird? being on the opposite side of the wheel from those practices, right? When we've worked the wheel long enough, after a while, we start to, um, we start to come back around on the spiral and it's the same, but it's never the same, right? Um, and so, you know, being in, being in the place of gathering seeds and now here we are in the place of scattering our seeds and soon enough we'll be gathering seeds again and soon enough we'll be scattering seeds again, so. The wheel turns and the wheel turns. <laughs> um, all right, let's get into some stuff, shall we? <laughs> Here is our Ostara wheel uh, illustrated by the one and only Ryan Jack Allred. You can find him at ryanjackallred.com. Uh, he's a fantastic illustrator, fine and funny. I mean, fine illustrations and sort of comic booky so illustrations. It didn't really make sense when I said that. <laughs> All right, what are we doing? Ostara. Okay, let's get into this, shall we? Uh, here at Ostara, we are witnessing the wheel go forward or come back around. Um, I think that for a long time, I definitely imagined uh, springtime as a we are coming back to spring and I really try to use the vocabulary of we are moving forward into spring we are spring is here either that either the spring has finally come to us and arrived from the future into the now um, or we have moved forward to it um, and why I'm, I'm mentioning that here is because one of the big uh processes, one of the big symbol sets that pagans and witches and heathens work with at, uh, well, for the wheel in general, is the goddess, of course, and um, the triple goddess in particular, the goddess as a three-faced archetype. And generally speaking, when we're talking about the triple goddess, we're talking about the maiden, the mother, and the crone, which is youth, adulthood, and old age, or naivety and uh, experience and wisdom. Um, or, you know, any set of triplicities that are out there in our various philosophical systems around the world. And oftentimes we will say that the crone, which is uh, the form of the goddess at winter, uh, the crone is turning back into the maiden. But I think that she is turning forward into the maiden. And I think that there is a real power in understanding that it isn't that we get to the crone and necessarily reach the end. We get to the crone and we keep going and we go into the next thing. Um, when we say that we get to the crone and then we go backwards, what to me that represents is that there isn't a relationship between the crone and the maiden. And I think that there is a, just as intimate of a relationship between the crone and the maiden as there is between the crone and the mother and the mother and the maiden. So. I think it's really important to understand that the crone and maiden have their own relationship to each other and they're just as close as, as the mother is to either of them. Why am I going into all of that? Because when we step into Ostara season, when we step into spring, we are shaking off the sleep and the death and the chaos of winter, finally. Right, We're like really shaking ourselves. We have a lot of that work happening in in bulk season. But during in bulk season, we're also still in the process of just waking up and like just coming back from Yule and the lands of the dead and 
our winter's sleep, right? So in bulk is this like very interesting kind of nebulous dreamscape bridge between the heart of winter and the beginning of spring. And we're just waking up and we're just kind of getting our feet under us and we're just sort of remembering things again. And at the same time, we're being asked by our spiritual work to tap into some really deep wisdom and, um, you know, dream huge and, uh, you know, question traditions and all of this stuff, right? It's very, it's very detached and floating from things. Again, nebulous is a word that always comes to mind for me when dealing with our in bulk work. Um, and at the same time, we're sort of demanding form from ourselves. Like we can't stay nebulous forever. We have to pick some things out of this sea of potential that we're floating in. And so here we come into, so we're, so we're tapping into this really potent crone energy in those spaces. Letting go of the old, questioning the old, examining the, the um, taken for granted in our lives. And also expanding ourselves into all that we've learned, all that we've seen, all that we've come to know. And then as we move through that process and we ultimately arrive at spring here at spring equinox at Ostara, ultimately what's being asked of us is can we sort of let go of all of that stuff and just start fresh? And for a really long time, that was a that was a paradox for me. That was a conundrum for me. I didn't understand that work. I didn't understand why would we go through all of that work in the crone to know, to take in wisdom, to take in experience, to take in information. Why would we do all of that just to turn around in spring and empty the cup out? Be like, I don't want to know any of that stuff. Never mind. And then I lived on Earth for a while. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I came to understand <laughs> that the crone part happens whether you want it to or not. <laughs> the acquiring of knowledge comes with life on Earth. And wisdom, knowledge to know, to be aware of something, anything, is a burden. It is a burden. It is. It becomes a weight that you carry. Um, when you don't know, you you might have problems, but you can move lighter through the universe. But to know weighs us down. We become worth more, in a sense, uh, because we carry all of this knowledge, all this experience, all of this knowing, skill sets, talents, crafts, um, you know, gossip, right? Whatever it is, we've accumulated it. And when we step into spring, we are surrounded by not just life, but reborn life, life anew, life coming back from also the lands of the dead. And we don't want to carry forward anything from the past that we don't have to. We want to deeply and profoundly examine everything, every tradition, every belief, every assumption, our wisdom, our lived experience, that stuff too. Because what spring wants of us and what Ostara wants of us is a lightness and an emptiness a willingness, a curiosity, an openness to we don't know what, we don't know what. And that is incredibly important work for the crone to come into a place of understanding my wisdom will only get me so far. At some point, not knowing will do me better than knowing. Now, we could say that just in general about the world because there's a lot of shit going on in the world and it would be lovely to not know about it and just wander blissfully through the world. 
That's the fool card. We've already done that part. <laughs> so no, we don't get an easy out like that. Sorry, <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. I am not talking about washing our hands of the responsibility of this reality. Sorry, <laughs> that, that's another line of work. P pick something else. If you, if you want to do that, don't be a witch. <laughs> I'm going to say it. I said it. I know it's a spicy take, but I'm saying it. Um, part of our work is to know. Part of our work is to see and then be able to address it. And to see is a burden. To know is a burden. It's a heaviness. And spring wants this lightness from us. And so in this place where Imbolc moves forward into Ostara, the crone chooses to move forward into not knowing again. The metaphor that I often use for this, um, I'll th I call it intellectual cynicism. Um, it's the idea of like, oh, I've heard those kinds of bands. I'm not going to the show tonight. Oh, I've seen that kind of art. I'm not going to the gallery opening this weekend. It's the idea that we've seen enough to know it all. We've seen enough that we can check out from that one or that round or, or this time of doing the thing because uh, I, I, I have experience with that. I've seen it. I know about it. But there is no way. Um, there is no way that we in our mortal coil can know it all or see it all or have done it all. And so every time spring equinox comes back around for us or rolls forward again for us, um, every time we return, every time we arrive at this season, we have a chance to empty ourselves out again, to purposefully forget or um, not necessarily forget, but make room for more. Make room for this next one might be one I've never seen before. I've never heard it before. I've never read this before. I've never tasted this before. I don't know anything about it. I know about these things. I've seen flowers before. I may have never seen this flower before. Let's go to the conservatory. Why not? Why not <laughs> is part of our intellectual cynicism. We don't want to look foolish. We don't want to look naive. We don't want to know. We don't want to look like we've never heard of flowers before, right? I've heard about flowers. I know what that's all about. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't not know about flowers, right? But think of how free we can be if we just allow ourselves to say, I don't know every now and then. <laughs> I don't have the answer to that. I can't fix this thing. Um, I don't know what you want. Uh, and I don't know what this situation has for me. Um, I don't know. Let's find out. Sometimes is the piece of sentence that comes after that. I don't know. Let's investigate. I don't know, but I'm curious. All of those states of being, curiosity, exploration, they get truncated by our wisdom. They get truncated by our lived experience. And so in this season, the wisest parts of us step forward and say, I'm going to shut up for a little while. And I'm just going to hang out in the back. And I'm just going to like, la, la, la. Like, I don't know what's going on. It's difficult. I think it's way easier to stay in that mode of, I already know about this. I've already seen it. I've already heard it. I've already tasted it. I've already read it. I don't need, I don't need more of that because it's a safe place. Not only do we not have to show our ignorance, which there's nothing wrong with ignorance, there's nothing wrong with not knowing. Um, it's what we do about our not knowing, right? So A, we, we're embarrassed to show our ignorance, and B, um, we're, we don't wanna grow. We're, we're comfortable, right? <laughs> I don't wanna change shape again, damn it. <laughs> I don't wanna make room in the filing cabinet for more stuff. Meh. <laughs> What if I forget, like, you know, a bean dip recipe from the 1980s? This is important shit up here. I don't, I don't need, you know, another thing to keep track of, right? So at spring, we get this incredible gift 
from our gods and goddesses, from our ancestors, and specifically from the earth herself, itself, Z-self, um, we get this fantastic, incredible gift to forget, to let go of that stuff, to move through and become new, to be born again in the truest sense. That phrase was stolen by people who didn't know what they were saying when they said it. <laughs> but it's this thing. And so uh, I think understanding that context and understanding that symbolism, or, or seeing it anyways, really puts an, a very interesting spin on some of our, or all of our, myths and deities and archetypes that we work with at this time of year. You know, there's some heavy hitters that roll through at Spring Equinox doing some fancy stuff. And to think of it as this deity consciously acknowledging, even I change form, even I change shape. And I also have to be renewed. I also have to change it up, empty out the cup and, and get ready for new stuff. I think also why this work can be hard for us is because I think inherent in all of this work is hope. I know, I know, I said it. I said the four letter word. <laughs> you know, you know how I, I just go for it in this class. You guys should know by now. Um, I think it's hope, right? If I'm looking to the future, I'm clearly assuming there's going to be one. Right? <laughs> so obviously I've got a little hope. Right? I've got a little optimism there. I'm like, there could be a tomorrow. Maybe we should do laundry. You know? <laughs> I'm not doing laundry. Uh, it's a hypothetical. My point is that I think uh, that's also part of why this shift from wise into curious can feel threatening, can feel destabilizing, can feel like, oh, that's hard work and I don't, I don't like that. That makes me uncomfortable. Because... It also implies hope. When we know better, we shut it down. Our pessimism is validated. It's realism. I'm not pessimistic. I'm being realistic, okay? We've all said it. We've all heard somebody say it. You're kind of being pessimistic. <laughs> I was when I was saying it, you know? And, and I think that embracing that, embracing that we are afraid, embracing that hope is hard, um, embracing the idea that to be wise or to be perceived <laughs> as being wise um, is sometimes a lot easier than, than it is to be perceived as somebody who has no idea what's going on or is curious or trying something for the first time. I think maybe sometimes we're afraid to be taken advantage of, but if we are wise, I think it's more about us looking foolish and not feeling comfortable in that place. Or, or feeling like we've let go of some kind of personal power because we have let go of our, our, um, our place in the intellectual ranks. <laughs> Why do we do this shit to ourselves? <laughs> what is wrong with us? We could be running around, no pants, trees, fruit for miles, beaches galore. No, it's credit ratings and this existentialist crap. I don't... I don't know why, <laughs> but here we are guys. And we're going to do witchcraft about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay. little sermon there for you. Um, but I think that this heady stuff is really important because the body is taking over so hardcore at spring and there's nothing wrong with that at all. God is blessed. But I think it's also really important for us to just have a, a moment, 30 seconds or more, you know, of, um, of reflection of, you know, where have I been? What have I seen? What have I experienced up until now? Knowing that, you know, you have absolutely absorbed some amount of that, maybe not all of it, but some amount, probably not a little, probably a lot. Um, you know, I mean, in any spring, I would be saying things like this. These last few years have been particularly exciting on planet Earth. So we have all gained a significant amount of wisdom and a significant amount of lived experience. And rightfully so, a lot of cynicism and a lot of pessimism. 
Let's be real, right? Like, our negative beaches, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> um, we've gained a lot of cynicism and a lot of pessimism over the last couple of years. And completely valid. Completely valid. But those are also places where we can have breakthroughs, right? A breakdown is always the beginning of a breakthrough. And I think that that is part of the Crohn's mystery here as well, or work or um, spell that they're casting on themselves, the Crone parts of us casting it on ourselves. Um, so... As we move through a star season, our witch's work centers in birth, fertility, preparing the people and the land for activity, acknowledging the balance of darkness and light, and initiations and rites of passage. Um, obviously, we've talked a lot about birth, or we've talked some about birth anyways. Um, we see lots of beings, plant and animal, being born all around the planet in the Northern Hemisphere anyways at this time of year. So even if uh, we are not giving birth to something, we certainly are seeing lots of things um, being born at this time of year. We're also seeing fertility come back to the land. And our fertility work also, again, starts in in-bulk season or started in in-bulk season, preparing the land even then by taking away the chaos of winter. So we are clearing the land. We might be blessing and purifying the land. We might be restoring uh, water systems and things like that to the land, uh, pulling out our dead, you know, dead branches from trees that broke off in winter storms and things like that. We're clearing the way. And now that we have cleared the way, now it is time to actually begin. In in bulk season, we begin to begin. In Ostara, we begin. And that response is already, the response is already showing from the natural world. So if you're lucky enough to have a yard and you've done any of that kind of stuff, you're probably already seeing little shoots come up in places where you cleared out leaves and little bits of grass coming up in places where you've, you know, picked up an old log or something like that. So you'll see the response almost immediately. And that's that fertility. Uh, fertility is, uh, side note, for witchcraft and spellcrafting purposes, fertility is now on the list from now all the way through fall equinox. Uh, there are going to be holidays that are more centered on fertility, some less. Ostara is our first one that comes up that is really truly centered on uh, fertility and, and has that kind of front and center in the mix of our witch work that we're doing. Um, and that is because as of uh, spring equinox, the sun has reached that midway point in its arc across the high-low graph that we talk about in every class. And um, every day will be longer than the night after spring equinox, all the way up to summer solstice, where we have the longest day, shortest night. And then the days continue to be longer than the nights, but balancing out with each other more and more so until we hit fall equinox. And so from spring equinox to fall equinox, whatever the energy is that's represented by the sun in your mythos, in your paradigm, your magical system, it's this is the high part of the year for the sun. From spring equinox to fall equinox, this is when the tent is popped. Bless. Okay. <laughs> Why can't I just say nice things? I'm so <laughs> what is my problem? <laughs> the sacred knocking of boots. The tent is popped for the Lord. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. We have been preparing the... Oh, and this is the other thing I want to say about fertility. <laughs> Thanks for putting up with you guys. <laughs> I'm assuming you're still here. If you're not, I totally understand. Um, this is the other thing I want to say about fertility. Here at Ostara season, our fertility work is in particular focused on... I'm trying, Bill. I'm fucking trying. <laughs> um, our fertility work in particular is focused on animals and the land and projects. It can also be focused on humans, 
But at Beltane, it's really going to be focused on humans. So at Ostara, it's really focused on animals and the land and projects and, like, the spirit of the house and, like, just generating fertile and virile vibes in general for just the reality in general. And again, if people want to, you know, bone down, knock the sacred boots, as we like to say, um, have sex, as others refer to it, uh, that fertility work is certainly supported at Ostara, but it is really, really supported at Beltane. Um, raised in the room. I mean, yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so we have also been preparing the people in the land for activity. We've especially been preparing the land for activity, in theory. And if you don't have an outside, if you live in an apartment building like so many of us do, or you live in a house where there's just, you know, hardly any yard at all, when I'm t what I'm talking about with land is your life. I'm talking about your world, your scope, your, your garden that you tend. Um, I will also in these classes refer to that as like your portion of the tapestry that you are in charge of weaving. Um, and so we have been, in theory, preparing our life or our land for whatever activity is going to come forward. If you haven't been, that's okay. Ways that you can engage in doing these things for both yourself and your home or your life or whatever is, you know, do you move the furniture around in your house when the light is different? Maybe it's time for that. The, the great spring cleaning and scrape spring purification festivals and rituals that start in, in bulk season certainly carry through. Um, one of my things that I recommend every year is changing out your winter clothes for your spring and summer clothes because we are officially leaving that life behind us. Our winter self is officially dead. <laughs> I, I'm, I get a little crazy sometimes. Yes, no, <laughs> you're absolutely, you're absolutely correct. Um, we are leaving our winter self behind. We are sloughing off. Uh, the winter version of ourself, and we are heading into the spring, summer, the high season version of ourself. So changing out the coats, changing out the bags, changing out the shoes. Um, you know, maybe it's time to, if you are, a, if you love going camping, maybe this is a great time to, as just a ritual to get out your camping gear, shake it out. Does anything need to be repaired before your season starts for the summer? Or do you, are you missing anything and you need to replace something? Anything like that can be a, a, a ritual um, in the form of preparing your life kind of, and, and yourself for the activity that's going forward. If it's safe and healthy for you and your body, you might start stretching or you might start stretching in a different way, knowing that you are going to be more physically active in these coming months. Um, you might change up your diet. You know, there's a lot of ways that we can address that stuff. So, uh, and it doesn't have to be some big sacred highfalutin ritual for us to, in a holy way and in a spiritual way for ourselves, acknowledge I'm changing, the season is changing, the energy is shifting, here we go. Okay, acknowledging the balance of darkness and light. I think that we talked a lot about that at the beginning of class and acknowledging this balance between the crone and the maiden and how important their relationship is with each other. Um, in this moment, especially on the day of the equinox, uh, which uh, this year is the 20th. That is the day that the sun in tropical astrology moves into the sign of Aries. Um, hoorah. Love our Aries. Aries rising. Don't fuck with me. Uh, <laughs> I mean, respectfully, I love you all, but I do choose violence as a brand. Um, <laughs> but here at the equinox, and again, especially on the day of the equinox, um, we stand with a foot in both worlds. We stand with a foot in the lands of the dead and we stand with a foot in the lands of the living. Uh, and if we remember back to our myths that we're working with at Samhain and at Yule season and carrying into Imbolc, our big myth is, um, the Ishtar, Inanna, Kor, Aphrodite, Descent and Return. We have a few other deities that go through a descent and a return or a death and a rebirth. We have a really fancy deity, uh, Jesus. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, but he has a big old rebirth ceremony at this time of year. Like, woo, fancy. They do all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, and on and on and on. Uh, 
it's it's huge. So we too are returning. This is us coming back from that. But this is that last. These are these last moments, um, in the, at the end, very end of in bulk season, and those hours where it literally turns from in bulk into spring equinox or Ostara. Um, we stand with a foot in both worlds, and we we get this chance to kind of finish up whatever our business was of winter, um, and say thanks. But don't look back. You probably won't recognize what you see anyways. Um, so don't worry about it. <laughs> just just keep looking forward. Know that it's the crone and the mother still looking through your maiden's eyes as you look forward. Or your youthful, reborn eyes, regardless of what gender we're assigning to, to our archetypes. Okay. Initiations and rites of passage. So we have sort of taught, danced around this subject, but this is something that's really important. And again, is um, embedded in all of these underworld myths is that we, you know, we have a deity going into the unknown, going through some type of a trial, and then ultimately coming back from that experience better for it, more well-rounded. They've let go of things they didn't need. They are uh, really coming into their power and it's sort of embracing their whole self and all of that stuff. But specifically with these initiations and rites of passage, um, I and we have a couple of other times of the year that we can do this kind of stuff, but specifically here at Ostara, these are initiations and or rites of passage for uh, people who are young in our lives, who are stepping into an older age group, or perhaps puberty has started for them or um, their gender or genders are starting to express. And it's a wonderful and perfect time to hold a celebration for that. If you are a person who has periods and you never had a period party, have one. Why not? If you're a person who experiences menopause and that's starting to set in, have a party. Why not? These are rites of initiation and rites of passage for us that are completely natural. They happen in lots of bodies throughout time. Lots of humans have experienced these things. Has your hair, has your body suddenly started growing hair somewhere new and exciting? Have a party. So you know, and there's all kinds of reasons why any of these things could happen. Um, but they are important shifts in our body, in our lived experience, in the way we understand our life to be and how we move through the world. And we want to welcome that stuff in and let it, um, let it find its home in us before we move into this next energy cycle so that we have totally embraced those things about ourselves. We're comfortable with them. We're like, hell yeah, absolutely. I totally do this. Check it out. It's fucking cool. And then we're heading off into the, the next adventure rather than I'm embarrassed because my body does this weird thing and mm, I can't go because you guys, because my thing is doing the thing and mm, fuck that. Forget about it. No, um, <laughs> not in 2022. There's no time, literally no time. <laughs> So these initiations and rites of passage, in particular for me, and I'm sure this is not true for all witches everywhere, but for me, these are specifically kind of those age-specific uh, rites of passage or points of initiation. Um, um, perhaps, you know, whatever. We've, we've talked about it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, body changes of those types uh, in particular, are, I think, are really important at this holiday. Okay, let's move on to... The next, wait a minute, there we go. I, I've been here before, I knew how to do this. All right, other names that this holiday has. Uh, Ladies' Day, Alban Eiler, Summer Finding, Idun, Schillingig's Day, and Maslanitsa. Ladies' Day, this is in reference to the maiden, the goddess in general, in all of her various forms. Um, welcoming in all of the spring goddesses and you know, witnessing the miraculous uh, transformation that the goddess has gone through, moving from the crone towards and into the maiden form of herself. Uh, Alban Eiler, this is the Druidic name for the vernal equinox. It means the light of the earth. And of course, as the sun is coming back, we know that the light is coming back and the heat is coming back as well. Ostara, the name of the class, the name of the holiday. This is... Um, a name probably used by Teutonic and Germanic pagans and heathens uh, for spring equinox festivals dedicated to the goddess Oster or Esther. Um, I have a, a big piece on my site 
about this that speaks to uh, the linguistic background of this particular goddess. Because for a long time, uh, well, not a long time, but I would say 30 or 40 years in late p modern pagan history, there was a, a, a popular myth that the word and name Ostara came directly from the goddess Ishtar or Astarte. And they may be related. I'm not saying that they're not, but... Um, some uh, Eastern European linguists a few years ago were basically tracing Indo-European, Indo-Aryan European language forms and p parts of words around the, the, the continent through time and ultimately arrived at the belief that Ostara ultimately connects to a goddess named Auster or Esther. There's a spelling that starts with an A and her name meant Dawn. Um, did that goddess have some kind of a connection to Astarte or Ishtar? Their names are very similar. We don't know if they were connected. Um, but they do have some of the same properties, and that's kind of interesting. Uh, especially when we think about uh, the maiden as connected to the goddess Venus, uh, Venus slash Aphrodite slash Kor, very connected to the goddess Ishtar and Astarte, including, you know, Ishtar may have been literally uh, represented by the planet Venus. Um, but Ishtar and Venus to that, to, in her early days, uh, very warlike. In fact, the descriptions of these goddesses are very much the way we would describe Mars, which is, of course, the ruling planet of the sign Aries, which is the planet or the sign that starts at Ostara. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Funny how that works. <laughs> So, yes, it's absolutely time to have a crone party, 100%. Grey panther power, 1,000%, 100 million percent, yes. <laughs> Just put some pink bows on your cat ears and you're good to go. Um, so, that. <laughs> I'm sure it's just a coincidence, right? Yeah, okay. Summer finding. Uh, this is one of the names that Norse folk use for this holiday. It is also sometimes referred to as Somers Blot, and that means the blood or the sacrifice of summer. Basically what this is, uh, is a hearkening to the fact that n definitely not all pagans, past or present, celebrate or celebrated all eight of the Sabbaths that we now know of in the Wheel of the Year. There have been many different ways to approach this. Eight is the current one. And yes, there were some cultures that celebrated eight, but there were a lot of cultures that celebrated six holidays or six big seasons of the years of the year. And a lot of the most northernly pagans, as well as a lot of the Celts, divided the year in half. There was the summer and the winter, and that was all that they cared about. And for a lot of the groups, celebrating summer finding, or summer's blot, as they call it, and I have a big piece about this up on my website as well. Um, they would literally send people up to the tops of the mountains. And the moment that uh, somebody finally saw the sun, they would holler and be like, bah, the sun is coming. And the day, whatever day it was, the day that the sun finally would crest the mountain and spill down into the valley where that village or town was, that was the day that they would celebrate Summer's Finding or Summer's Blot, which I think is really, really beautiful. And it was basically, you know, from then until the sun got low enough in the sky where it wouldn't hit the valley anymore, that was their summer time. Um, I love that stuff. Okay, Idun with her golden apples. This is one of the great Norse goddesses. And uh, this is a day that uh, she is absolutely celebrated, 100%. Sheila in a gig's day. Sheila um, is one of my all-time favorite goddesses because she is incredibly rude and uh, wonderful in every possible way. Uh, if you're not familiar, um, she is usually depicted as a grotesque that is carved into the wood or stone of very old uh, Western European uh, British Isles churches and cathedrals. Uh, and she is usually depicted as a naked old woman crouched down and reaching under her legs and pulling her vagina wide, wide apart so that there's a big old hole between her legs. It's pretty cool. Um, you know, this is the old time religion that we need as far as I'm concerned. Okay. 
Uh, and she, for me, very much is this cross-section of maiden and crone energy. Uh, her myths are all about an old wise woman at the side of the road who, you know, offers food to starving knights who in they're like well what's the payment she's like a kiss sweetie and they're all like absolutely not i'll starve and finally you know there's always the one night that's like just a kiss or uh you know <laughs> and i go test the tent pegs and you know she's like absolutely let's do this and she turns into a maiden <laughs> what <laughs> wait a minute huh <laughs> and so she is body she's rude she farts and burps and curses i wouldn't know a thing about this kind of behavior i've just read about it it's, wow but um <laughs> uh she is she's rude and and wonderful and also is very vital and fertile and virile in her own right in her oldness and her decrepitness um, so there's a really interesting swirl of our Ostara symbolism all caught up in this one goddess. And, uh, and she, um, she, you know, kind of sits at this crossroad moment. So this day where winter turns into spring is her day. And then last but no, certainly not least is Maslenica. Um, this is a Slavic holiday that connects us to a uh, plowing day and uh, particularly a deity named Dazbog. We see bog a lot. Uh, bog, B-O-G as in, you know, like a bog, you know, where they put sacrifices <laughs> all over Europe. Bog means God <laughs> for some Slavic folks. I'm sure it's just a coincidence. <laughs> um, and... Uh, we talked about this in last week's um, podcast or the week before podcast. Um, Maslenica is this really beautiful life coming back, fertility, virility coming back, spring festival that Slav folk uh, have celebrated and still to this day celebrate. It is absolutely a pre-Christian festival that has been Christianized in some places, but uh, there are so many of the pagan traditions still built into it that um it's kind of it's kind of unavoidable <laughs> um and there's gift giving and there's you know the youth of the village coming together and jumping over bonfires and doing things like that and in particular i think uh one of the interesting traditions of maslanitsa uh are these little red and white dolls slash flowers slash wristbands that are woven by people and given to each other as gifts they're hung in the trees um, and, uh, when they, you know, finally break apart, uh, you know, a, a, a trouble is destroyed or a wish is released or whatever. Um, but these colors, red and white are colors that we see all over the place at spring. And, um, there's lots of really cool traditions to Maslanitsa. Go check it out. Uh, but in particular, I think that connection to red and white is really cool because again, it's, it, we see it in so many different um, holiday traditions around the planet. So, like what? Well, let's talk about it. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. So, we are moving into our global themes. Um, to turn my page and pay attention to my own notes. Uh, beginnings, fertility, initiations, rejoicing, the return of sun and life are the types of things that we are seeing in... Um, holidays all over the planet. Uh, we have a lot of New Year's celebrations, and in particular, Nauru's um, from our Persian and Zoroastrian friends and ancestors, uh, and the main colors of that holiday, red and white. Um, red and white feature prominently in a whole bunch of the uh, Chinese and um, Central Asian spring festivals that happen now, whether it is uh, you know, honoring ancestors with springtime rituals or welcoming youthful energy in or welcoming back spring itself or like going and watching the full moon at spring is really important for a lot of uh, Asian tradition folks. Um, red and white, red and white, red and white, all up in the mix with all of that stuff. So we see pretty much on the week of Ostara, and that's basically March 15th, to March 21st, holidays like the Oshosi Hunter Festival from our Yoruba friends and ancestors, the Dumuzi uh, returns from the underworld, that's the Mesopotamian, uh, Sumerian Babylonian myths with uh, um, 
Ishtar and Inanna. Um, Akitu Fest of Marduk, also Babylonian. Side, you guys know, I already have, I, you already know. I have beef with Marduk. I don't even know why I talk about him because we have beef. We have serious beef. I got beef with a couple of the gods, but Marduk is on the top of the list. We need to talk if you see him. Send him my way, okay? T and Teffy Day from our Irish friends. Uh, and this is uh, an example of the um, marriages that we start to see with this fertility stuff. As I said before, a lot of the fertility stuff that we see happening at this time of year is dedicated to the land itself, uh, the prosperity of the community or the atmosphere in general or the village, um, the prosperity or uh, fertility for the animals, fertility for the plants, that kind of thing. And then to a lesser extent, fertility for the humans. Um, but what we do definitely see past and present, pagan and otherwise around the planet are sacred marriages begin again. Uh, and we've had a little bit of a break from sacred marriages. There's been a few of them through Samhain, or excuse me, Samhain and Yule and in bulk season. I don't know why I say Samhain sometimes. Um, I don't even like that band, but whatever. <laughs> we see a few uh, sacred marriages happening during the fall and winter season, but the majority of our sacred marriages that we see in religions around the world take place from spring through summer and, and into the beginning of fall. Um, and so T and Teffy are one of those um, from our Irish ancestors. The Feast of Yara and Lada, same thing. This is also woven into the Maslanitsa tradition um, from our Slavic friends. Yara and Lada are, are two very youthful uh, deities, god and goddess, that represent springtime fertility, virility, youthfulness, joy, playfulness. Um, and in some sources... Uh, the various gods and goddesses of the Slavs are discussed as separate beings, but there are many stories that talk about Yara and Lada turning into the other gods and goddesses and that they are also triplicity-based and all sort of versions of each other. Very cool stuff. Uh, from our Taoist friends and ancestors, we have the Feast of Water Spirits, uh, East Spirits, and the Spirits of Spring. And uh, from our Egyptian friends, we have the spring harvest happening at this time of year. Yes, for ancient Egyptians, this would be the harvest season because summer is far, or was, and especially now, uh, but even then, summer was far, far too hot for them to grow crops successfully. In fact, uh, there's lots of myths of deities like going on rampages. There's a myth around uh, about uh, Sekhmet, the lion-headed goddess, going on a rampage and you know burning everybody to a crisp <laughs> in the middle of summer. Um, exactly that. Uh, <laughs> exactly that. <laughs> um, and so uh, in summer for ancient Egyptians, it was far too hot for them to grow anything. And so their growth season begins at the end of summer when the summer rains, the monsoons kick in and the Nile crests and floods its banks and it would flood the deltas and soak everything with, you know, tons and tons of water. And then as it cooled off in fall, they would begin to plant things and it would grow through winter. And then they harvest, or they would at then in the ancient days, uh, harvest in spring. So this is the spring harvest festival for those cats. Um, other holidays that we see past and present for this season, stuff that comes up for us. Of course, we have Proserpina returning from the underworld. Proserpina, Another name for Kor, Aphrodite, Venus. These are all the same goddess going on their underworld journey. And at spring equinox, they come back. Their underworld journey, um, uh, their underworld journey is a representation of what the Northern Hemisphere is experiencing during winter, which is the death of the natural world. Um, Demeter, her mother, mourns and will not allow life to grow as she is trapped in the underworld with uh the lord of the dead hades or pluto um we have uh various versions of that story that we talk about in this class 
And I think that um, remembering that there are versions where Aphrodite is empowered and she's choosing to go on this underworld journey also makes sense for us when we think of that metaphor of the crone turning forward into the maiden. Here we have the maiden choosing to turn forward into the crone. Uh, and this is the end of her process in doing that. Um, I know, right? <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> it might be past life ancestors. I say it that way um, to be inclusive of all times. I don't know when somebody is listening to this, the podcast or the videos. They could be watching this 6,000 years ago. I don't want to alienate anybody. Rude, right? They could be watching 6,000 years from now. Who knows? So everybody is invited to these holidays as far as I'm concerned. All of our friends and all of our ancestors. <laughs> Okay, a few other holidays that happen for us at this time of year. I'm not going to go through everything, but one of the ones that I have to talk about because I talk about it every year because it is amazing is from our Shinto and Japanese friends and ancestors, Honan Matsuri. Grab your chonies, kids, because this is a good one. This festival dedicated to prosperity... Let's get all the quotes in there. Prosperity, okay. <laughs> is held in a little prefecture of Japan, three hours north of Osaka. Those who turn up get turned up with probably drunk Shinto priests jamming on musical instruments and passing out all you can drink sake from gigantic barrels. <laughs> Once the crowds are completely lit, the real show begins. The priests haul forth an eight-foot, 600-pound, solid wood phallus and parade it through the village to the cheers of the festival goers. At some point, it is spun furiously on the ground before being set down and prayed over and then rice cakes shower everyone. <laughs> now that is how you welcome spring. That is how you assure fertility for the land. <laughs> That's amazing. That's incredible. Um, I absolutely love it. Um, Okay, a couple of other holidays because I can't skip these because they're too important. We also have Holi, which is the Indian uh, or Hindi uh, springtime New Year's. They actually celebrate four New Year's for the four seasons throughout the year. Holi and um, Diwali <laughs> are the two big ones. Diwali happens at fall and Holi happens here at spring. And in fact, tonight slash tomorrow is Holi for Hindus because it always falls on the Virgo full moon, which of course is the last full moon of winter before we step into spring, but it is the, the full moon that is going to be the closest to spring equinox. So it's always held at this time of year. It is very much treated like a New Year's celebration. Old stuff is pulled down, new decorations are put up, there's lights put up, people will get new clothes if they have the chance to, they'll eat something new, um, they get together with friends and family and share food together and, and have a big festival. And again, very much like a lot of our other uh, late winter, early spring festivals, this is about waking life back up in the body, waking the body or waking the mind back up and the spirit back up and waking the, the community back up for like, all right, let's go and do stuff. Let's celebrate. We're back. Also happening at this time of year, from as I mentioned before, our Persian and Zoroastrian friends and ancestors, we have Nauruz. Na means light new and Ruz means day or year, but it relates back to a word that means light. So Nauruz is new day or new year, but we are also saying new light. And we could certainly say that about the sun's cycle that we are celebrating at this time of year. Uh, this has been observed by folks in the Middle East for over 3,000 years uh, on the vernal equinox. It is always celebrated on spring equinox. Um, and this is, as I said, New Year's Day for lots and lots of folks in the Middle East and around the world, um, where, wherever we find those folks. Um, really beautiful holiday, beautiful celebration. Lots of eggs, lots of egg dyeing, and lots of red white and red playing a very central theme in uh, the Nauru celebrations. 
Um, also at this time of year, we have from our uh, Roman friends and ancestors, for the most part, just their ancestors, we have the Megalesia. Uh, this is another holiday that I have written about a lot. <laughs> uh, pro probably too much, honestly. <laughs> There's a big old piece on my website. I highly recommend going and checking it out. Um, this is a holiday dedicated to a sweet old gal named Sybil or Kybel. Um, I pronounce her name Kybel. A lot of people pronounce her name Sybil. They, they spell it with a C. I spell her name with a K, K-Y, Kybel, um, or Kebeli. And that is because as we push back in time and we find older and older versions of this goddess, we find that she is um, uh, referred to as Kubebe, Kamele, um, Kubala. Um, she has a lot of uh, K-U-B type names or K-U-M. And there are many forms of her name that sound very similar to Kali. Is she connected to Kali? I don't know. But some of her names are similar to Kali. Uh, this is a world builder goddess. And for me, she contains a lot of really potent spring symbolism. Um, we're going to come back to her in just a second. Uh, but Kybel um, is a world builder. And I think that she is a really important way of accessing uh, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here, Ostara and Spring Equinox and all of this, because... To look at her, to look at her in the face, the way that the Romans carved her, she's not a young person. She's matronly. She's an older woman. She's clearly lived. But why I think that she carries so much of spring energy um, is because she has the hope and the vision to build a world. And, you know, that's something that we're talking about that's really inherently key to a lot of the spiritual and philosophical work that we're doing in Astara season is hope, right? Believing that there is, in fact, going to be a tomorrow and we should do something about that. Well, clearly, Kybel also believes that there's going to be a tomorrow and what she's going to do about it is she's going to build an empire. She's going to build a city. And so when we look at her, we see that her crown is literally, um, it's literally a city, Oh, that's further away. That's as close as I got. Sorry. If you look closely at that, that's actually like a wall. It would be like the gate where you enter into a city. And that's on purpose. The Romans absolutely thought of her as a world builder. Uh, the Romans were absolutely in love with Kybel. They really thought she was pretty special. Um, in fact, the Sibylline uh, priestesses, the oracles of Sibyl, um, were very much all about this goddess and sent out Roman troops into what we now call Turkey, what was Anatolia at the time, um, to find her sacred cities, her old sacred temples, and in particular to bring back a meteorite that was thought to be the embodiment of this goddess. Uh, it was found, um, and we can think of a couple of different religions that have a fancy meteorite at the center of their belief system. So this is not a one-off here. This was certainly a thing for ancient people to be very excited about meteorite as representative of a deity or even the deity itself. Um, and the, the meteorite was brought back to Rome. And uh, as the stories go, um, it, the boat carrying the meteorite could not enter the river Tiber and sail up into the center of the city. And a bunch of women had to go meet the boat at the mouth of the river and tie ropes to themselves that they then tied to the boat. And they, they towed the, uh, the, the meteorite on the ship up to the spot where her temple was going to be. Um, no, no man could get the boat to move. Only women could bring her into the city. And that's pretty true to her <laughs> myth cycles and, and her symbolism. It's definitely stuff that we see with her. Um, but they brought her up. It took Rome 13 years, uh, approximately 12 years, 13 years, to build a proper temple for her. Um, and her rituals 
uh, were gigantic. They happened all year long. But in particular, here at springtime was the Megalesia. Mega, as in massive, right? And um, and this was the great death, life, death, and rebirth uh, ceremony for Kybel and her um, her companion, Attis, her god consort that she carried on with. Hey, very cool. That's very cool. Guys, check that in the chat. Uh, UW, Slavic department, usually puts on a pretty cool Maslanitsa. That's freaking cool. Yeah, it's at the end of February. That makes sense. It is like a coming up into spring kind of thing. Yes. Um, but dope. Good to know. Next year, I'm all about that. Um, during her festival, uh, she had um, a wide variety of priests and priestesses that would serve her. Uh, it is uh, the the Megalesia takes place over the course of about two weeks. Um, it is the the proper part of it runs from April fourth to April tenth. But what we mean by that is the fourth day of the moon to the tenth day of the moon, and really it's the whole first half of that moon cycle. Um, this year it's going to start very close to April 4th um, because for this first half of 2022, the moon and the dates on our calendar actually line up um, very closely. Not exact, but pretty close. So the first day of the moon is also very close to the first day of the month. It's very handy, actually. It's quite nice. Um, and so, really, from the beginning of April to the middle of April is the, the proper time for celebrating the Megalesia. Um, lots of wild things happened during her festivals. You can read all about it on my website. But um, the t trigger warning or content warning, there's there's definitely some, some graphic content in there of various sacrifices that were made by humans. Uh, of humans. Not human sacrifice, but... Humans sacrificing of themselves and living to tell the tale later. Uh, I'll leave it for you to discover what I mean by that. <laughs> but uh, here's a clue. Um, many men would petition over the course of the year to become Gali priests of uh, of this deity, of, of Kaibel. Um, here she's again. Let me scooch. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to this picture. Um this is an, I put this in specifically because uh, you can see how her crown is really a city. Um, so this is uh, one of her Gali priests holding a drum or a rachetta and uh, singing her praises. This is an art gallus. This would have been a high priest of hers. And these uh, folks uh, petition to become priests or priests of the goddess and during the megalesia they make an ultimate sacrifice and they become priestesses of the the goddess um and they would run out of the temple sort of in an ecstatic state and the homes around the temple would immediately welcome them in and the women that were there in the homes would dress them in their own clothes skirts dresses scarves um, very sandals and things like that, and then would send them back out into the street and they would go back to the temple to be taken care of by the priests and priestesses who had gone through this in years past. And they were fed milk and honey like newborn babies. Um, and it was very much this idea of being born again in the uh, glory of the goddess, um, et cetera, et cetera. So <laughs> pretty cool stuff that the Romans were into. Um, but coming back to these pictures, uh, let's come back to Kybel a little bit because um, this is some interesting stuff. So during, not only that fun stuff would happen, but one of the other important things that would happen is um, these, these images of her, in particular, this shield uh, would be taken from her temple, taken down to the river Tiber, washed in the rivers, uh, dressed with violets, like the flowers, and then brought back into the temple and, and reset up. Sometimes her statue was treated to that as well, like once a year. Um, sometimes the images of Addis were treated to that as well. But while this was happening, 
her she had various groups of uh, priests and priestesses that served her. The Gali priests were the young men that then, after they had gone through their transformation, became the Melisse. And of course, Melisse connected to bees and beekeeping and all of that stuff. So yes, it, it goes deep with this goddess. Um, and she also had another collection of priestesses uh, who were called the Corribantes. And the priestesses were warrior priestesses and they would dress, ha they, they, were, um, they had one breast exposed at all times. They carried a, a giant shield and a giant sword um, and they were dressed in armor and, and ready for fighting, ready for war. And part of, their, um, uh, part of their tradition or their ritual that they would do every year was to take these sacred artifacts down to the River Tiber, have them washed, and blessed in the water and then brought back. And the Corribante's job was to scare the shit out of everybody while this was happening. <laughs> so when it was time for the procession to take place and for folks to go and do their thing, the Corribantes would spill out into the street and would scream and holler and clash their swords and shields together. And they would also play musical instruments and just make the biggest, loudest, scariest racket that they could make. It was literally psychic warfare, a psychic attack or a sonic assault on the people around them. They, they were literally, you know, don't look at us, stay away. And this, if this noise isn't scary enough, you know, we've got real weapons to back it up with. So just back up. And then within this cacophony and chaos, uh, these sacred artifacts would proceed down to the river, be blessed, and proceed back to the temple, screaming and wailing and chaos and freak out the whole time on either side. Um, and so uh, my new noise project is... <laughs> don't steal that. I've already taken it. It's, it's, don't, don't steal that. But, um, but I, I love that. And it's just some of the really incredible stuff with this goddess. Um, her... Her sites where she was worshipped in, um, in, uh, excuse me, um, why are we there? Oh, right, here we go. Sorry. Her sites that were worshipped in Anatolia, uh, some of them go back at least 10,000 years, and they're places like Katul Hayuk and Gobekli Tepe. Um, and here is where we find some really interesting ties. So let me show you this statue again. If you look down at the bottom of the statue, you can see a lion on one side there on the left. Um, that's because the goddess that this Roman version is based on is here. This is a carving or um, a clay sculpture of Kybel from approximately 8,000 years ago found at Katul Hayuk. Note the lions on either side. Now, um, digs that are happening at Gobekli Tepe and Katul Hayuk are dating both of these sites back to around 10,000 BCE or before current era. And wouldn't you know, here's a funny coincidence for you. The constellation that the sun was in at spring equinox about 10,000 years ago was Leo. Total coincidence, guys. Don't get crazy now, right? That's a conspiracy theory. Don't get crazy. But, you know, it's it's literally right there in front of you. Okay. So, <laughs> so this is a carving of her from, again, around 8,000-ish years ago. Um, this is a, another uh, carving of her or sculpture of her from around that same time period. Note the lines, the crisscrossing uh, patterns on her. Um, and so in here in our, in, you know, coming up 7,000 years later, I mean, here, here's a real trip for you. We in this era right now in 2022 are thousands of years closer to the Romans than the Romans were to the people who actually worshiped this goddess in her original form or some of the oldest forms that we know of. I mean, we are only, you know, two to 3,000 years away from, from those guys. They were trying to pick up traditions from 7,000 years before them. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and so here is Rome's depiction of Kybel with Attis in the chariot being pulled by four lions 
So there's our lion symbolism. You might, if you really want to get deep on it, um, the rest of this shield is a depiction of the other constellations and the seasons. And so this is likely a calendar type of, uh, of shield, but specifically it would have been a shield showing this goddess's ownership of time and seasons. And if we need a, a reinforcement of that, will we have eight spokes on the wheel of her chariot? It's that easy, folks. So, um, I don't know why I just said that, but, <laughs> but it sounded fancy, didn't it? Um, so, you know, we know that this goddess was seen as a goddess that controlled time, that understood the seasons, that understood the rising and falling of crops and cycles and things like that. Um, there's her priests. Here's another depiction of her in her chariot pulled by lions with the sun and the moon above um, one of her priests in attendance, that's also Addis with her in the chariot. And we have an eight-spoked wheel uh, there. Another depiction of her in her chariot holding a rochetta or a type of hand drum, as we see her other priests holding at times, being pulled by lions. And here we have seven spokes on the wheel. And that's important, too because seven was an incredibly magic number in the ancient world. It's still a very magic number. Uh, seven is the number of ancient planets, which the Romans absolutely knew about and were watching in the skies. So again, when we see seven on a sculpture from that time period, there is that implication of time and seasons and the cyclical nature of the sky and the seasons and all of that good stuff. Okay. So, okay, we're going to go into a little bit of other stuff and then we're going to circle back around to some of this that we've been talking about. Um, what else do I want to show you? Quickly, we are going to get into the astronomy and then we're going to talk about, we're going to look at our sky guide. Uh, we're going to get right into the tarot. I'm going to skip through some stuff. Again, if you want all the information that comes for this class, uh, go pick up the, uh, join my Patreon at nine bucks or higher and get the book. Um, Cause there's stuff that we just are not going to have time to talk about today. Even if I hadn't gone into my crazy ass sermon at the beginning, uh, it would have been filled with a bunch of other stuff and we still wouldn't get to it all. So... <laughs> Um, but I, it, it needed to happen. Um, okay, so here are our constellations that we are working with during Ostara season. For folks that practice Western or tropical astrology, the moon, or excuse me, the sun is moving into the sign of Aries and it's going to move through Aries and on March 20th, well, March 19th, it will move into the sign of Taurus just before Beltane starts. Um, for sidereal astrology slash what is actually happening in the sky, because Western astrology is 2000 years behind, uh, the sun is just entering Pisces. And so it's passing through Pisces and into the sign of Aries during Ostara season. Um, be that as it may, these are the constellations that we are working with for the most part. Um, our... We'll come back to these in just a second. Our full moon names for March are names like the Chaste Moon, the Crust Moon, the Sugar Moon, uh, Sap Moon. And that connects to lots and lots of uh, Native American groups doing their maple tapping ceremonies at this time of year. Maple can only be harvested during a certain time of year because it has to be harvested during a certain temperature range. If it's too cold, if it's too hot, the trees do not want to give up their sap. So it is a very precious window of time. It's six-ish weeks, and it starts, of course, at different times, even on the same continent, because it's going to be a little colder here, a little warmer there from week to week, day to day, right? That's the whole shift of this season. Um, and so we get those names like Sap Moon, Sugar Moon, um, from our Native American friends and ancestors who are doing maple tapping um, ceremonies at this time of year. Uh, other moon names that we have uh, for March, Fish Moon, Windy, New, Windy Moon, Moon When Eyes Are Sore From Bright Snow, and Death Moon are some of the names. A lot of these come from uh, 
Native American tribes, a lot of Algonquin. Um, some of these are Celtic or pagan, um, some Asian. So there's a, a big collection of names for these moons, but or for the March moon in particular. But but mostly we get this sense of um, sleepiness, dreaminess, and then moving into action with a lot of these names. Uh, and our full moons in March are always going to be near the stars of Virgo or Libra because the sun is moving through Pisces and Aries and those are the two signs that are opposing it. That means also that our new moons are going to be in the signs of Pisces and Aries during this time of year. The last full moon of winter, and that's our full moon that we're having on uh, tomorrow, <laughs> uh, or whenever you're watching this, um, it happened on March 18th. It's our Virgo full moon. That's our last full moon of winter. This is also called the worm moon. Um, so coming back to our constellations, a lot of interesting stuff here. We talked about some of this in the last class with the symbolism around Pisces. And we also talked about, uh, the symbolism around Pisces in, uh, some other classes. I don't remember now what. <laughs> I've taught a lot of classes this month. I'm sorry. <laughs> a little out of it. Um, but the big takeaway with the constellation of Pisces is this. It is depicted as two fish shooting in different directions. One fish is shooting off to the right, um, off the edge of the page here in this picture. Um, and it's sort of shooting horizontally. And then the other fish is shooting straight up. And we see that one here in, in the process or in this picture. And some constellations depict that the star Alarisha is a cord that ties these two fish together. Uh, there's a lot of myth as to why these two fish are tied together and what's supposed to be happening, where I get into all of that stuff. What I think is interesting here is a couple of different things. Uh, one, the directions of the fish. Um, two, the star named Alresha or Alresha. It's spelled both ways. Both are right. Um, it means cord. It means tie or the knot. But um, a reshetto is a hand drum. And it is also a sieve, which is, of course, a woven mesh of knots you know, <laughs> made out of rope uh, that would have been used for catching fish interestingly enough, um, but also a name for a hand drum, a hand drum that is very similar to the drums that we see Kybel and her priests carrying in those sculptures that we just looked at. So I, here is a place where I can show you I don't know everything. I know, shocker, but I don't know it all. <laughs> Come with me now on a journey of only knowing a few things. <laughs> I don't know exactly why. This name has the same name as this drum that's carried by this goddess that has a festival at this time of year. And I, I mean, that connection is obvious, right? If, if that is a connection, let's say big if, this is my, my projection and my hypotheses around this information. I'm not telling you that this is for sure true. Just a crazy lady on the internet yelling about things, that's all. But, um, but wouldn't it be interesting if, right? Um, seems like an interesting coincidence that She's here, the drum is here, and the fixed star is here with the same name. Um, also interesting that it's the name of a sieve used to catch fish in the sign of Pisces. Okay, maybe there's that connection. It's pretty obvious. But why, why does this drum and this sieve have the same name? Was the sieve played like a drum, right? Was it, was it not hit like this, but was it something that was like... Sh -sh 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 right? Can you imagine with me like a sieve over something? and running your hands or nails or something over it and sort of making that like rhythmic ch -ch -ch kind of a sound. Okay. Keep that in the back of your mind. Again, I might be full of it, but these are some of the weird connections that I've made over the years, looking at all of this stuff and going, wait a minute, does it, has anybody else read this Wikipedia page? This is so weird. <laughs> so that's Pisces. All right. But the season is absolutely controlled or run by the sign and the vibes and the energy of Aries. And Aries is our spring bringer. 
Uh, it is depicted as a ram some of the time. It is depicted as a lamb some of the time. Um, and, uh, and as we push further back in time, the constellation of Aries was not a ram or a lamb. It was a tripod with a fire on top or a sacred lamp or a, a you know, a, a sensor of a type that's basically a dish on three legs with fire. Also, sometimes the lamb or the ram is depicted with a light or a fire or a gem on their forehead. Interesting stuff. Also something that's interesting about this um, is how the constellation is depicted. Where the fixed stars Mesothrim and Sheraton are, are the eyes of the ram or the lamb, but its head is actually turning backwards and looking back at Taurus, who is coming up over the horizon behind it, rather than looking forward where Pisces is. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting thing. There's something about this creature that's sort of here at the beginning, but considering things from the past to the future, something, something. Um, these fixed stars... Uh, have some interesting names. Hamal is the horn star. Makes sense, right? With our our rams. Um, Sheraton is a signal fire. Mesarthim, the tripod. So here we have little traces of some of these older forms. Of course, Aries is a fire sign. So kind of cool that at one point, this was literally depicted as a fire, a signal fire of some kind, or maybe a holy fire of some kind. But one of my other favorite names, or other favorite fixed stars that's in this, is Barani, which is way out at the end towards Taurus, and that is the Yoni. Um, uh, yes, the Yoni, as in the Yoni. So again, we have a really direct connection to a goddess like Sheila Nagig, right? Who is a crone that is moving forward into the maiden, who is filled with light and curiosity, but is also really body sitting next to a fire, enticing people to come and help her change shape. And it's just a lot, but it's really good, right? <laughs> it's so good. Um, last year... Uh, I really went off. If you really, if you really, really, really want more about this, um, I do recommend watching last year's class. I talk a lot more in that class about uh, the megaliths around the world that were built to acknowledge spring equinox, and we're going to get into some of that in just a second, uh, but not as much as we did last year. And um, I also go really heavy on our Aries symbolism. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Pisces symbolism that here in just a second. Um, but I really go in on the Aries symbolism and I highly recommend checking it out. We're not going to talk about it this year. Um, it just, uh, you know, it, it's not that it didn't come up. It's that there's so much material for each class and the folks that have been here year after year know <laughs> we've talked about a lot of things in each of these classes. It can't all come up in an, in any one class. I have reconciled that within me now. It was, it was tough. It used to be that I would just fire hose information into people's faces. <laughs> so, so sorry about your ocular cavity, uh, sir or ma'am. But, um, but uh, I have reconciled that I can't say it all. So go and watch last year's class if you want more information about Aries and Aries symbolism in particular and how it plays out here at Spring Knox. It's pretty cool. As well as more information on the megalithic sites around the planet, literally, and throughout time, literally, um, that honor and mark Spring Equinox. But, and, uh, here in the astronomy section... Um, is there anything else I wanted to say about this? No, there actually isn't. I just noticed some of my other notes from last year and was like, oh yeah, no, I'm not talking about that. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> I had to do it just for old time's sake. Right? <laughs> okay, so briefly, our sky guide. Briefly, our sky guide. So on March 15th, the sun entered Pisces for our sidereal astrology folk. 
Uh, March 18th, we will have a full moon in Virgo. And then on March 20th, the sun will enter Aries in tropical astrology. And that is the, um, the beginning of the, of the start of the thing. Uh, we have the heliacal rising of the fixed star Deneb El Gedi. We have uh, the waning half moon in Capricorn, new moon, March 31st, uh, eight degrees of Libra. Now, for some folks around the world, mostly folks that are on the west coast of North America, uh, Hawaii, Alaska, those types, um, this will be a black new moon because it will be our second new moon in a month. For the rest of the people around the planet, I do believe this new moon actually falls on April 1st. It's, so it is technically in the next month. And then we have our waxing half moon. April 14th, the sun enters Aries in sidereal. And um, all the way down here in April 19th, the sun enters Taurus in tropical astrology. And we will already be setting ourselves up for Beltane. This is really important when we think about what Ostara season can feel like. I think a lot of times for a lot of us in the Northern Hemisphere, Ostara uh, season feels like an engine that is picking up speed and picking up motivation. And oh my God, here we go. Oh, oh, that thing, right? So we start out slow and it's getting faster and faster. Well, part of that is because this time period skips by really, really quickly. <laughs> we have one month and then it is, you know, the middle of April and then boom, we are already heading into Taurus season and Beltane season and you know, and away we go, right? On to whatever's going to happen in the high part of the year um, for the rest of spring and all of summer and the beginning of fall and all of that. So this this time period, this next month or so between March 20th and April 20th is a really precious time. And I want you to remember that this can feel like it's just getting faster and faster and faster. And you, as I often say, have every right to take a time out, to put yourself in time out if it feels like it's getting too fast, too quickly. But this is the time period where the energy and the momentum are going to start to pick up. And we literally see it in our astrology astronomy that we literally are just bouncing from one thing to the next. Moving back to, um, speaking of the astronomy or the astrology, moving back to the constellations, in ancient astrology, the sign of Aries and or I should say this portion of the sky where this constellation is traditionally was a lot of bad luck and different astrology systems interpret stuff different ways. So I'm not saying anybody's right or wrong. I'm just saying that at previous astro systems, this portion of the sky or this constellation in particular was really looked at as mostly bad stuff, mostly hard, mostly you know, let's avoid it if we can type events. Um, and so that's part of why, I love this, it's part of why Aries is so small. <laughs> because that was the way the ancient world was like, well, we have to have some bad stuff, but let's see if we can just sh jam it into this one little, these few degrees. And then, oh, it's Taurus. Oh, we're fine now. Everything's okay. <laughs> I love that. I'm like, yes, let's just take time and space and squeeze it or expand it however we need it to be. It's totally fine. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Okay, so that is our sky guide. Um, this, of course, is in the um, the folder for patrons. Um, for our full moon in Virgo, here is a meditation for you just before we get ready to do our Ostara work. We want to make sure that we have cleaned out and sealed up and finished off as much as is reasonable as much as is realistic our winter work and in virgo it's an earth sign we want to think about what are those cycles that we have inherited are they blessings are they curses are they blurses this is a time for you to think about what are the threads you have inherited uh and and you know, how are you weaving them into the tapestry or your portion of the tapestry that's your responsibility? Um, it is also your responsibility to deeply examine those threads. It's your responsibility to deeply examine, deeply question traditions, customs, assumptions, beliefs, practices, stances, that were held by previous generations, especially generations, especially people in those previous generations that we hold dearly. 
right? I love my grandpa. He's just got some weird ways of looking at the world. We can love grandpa and also call him out. And maybe grandpa has passed, right? Maybe we can't physically call him out on that stuff. But I think an even more amazing way of honoring grandpa is to say, you taught me the best that you knew. I'm going to evolve that from here, from from there to, to where we need to be. Um, and in that, we can also forgive. We can hold accountable and forgive at the same time our, our relatives and our ancestors from the past of saying, you weren't perfect and you did do some dumb stuff. Um, but I'm also going to believe that a lot of the dumb stuff you did, you were doing from a place of you were just hoping for the best for your family and trying to do the best with what you had and what you knew. And sometimes that's not the truth about our ancestors, but, um, but here at spring, you know, with this last moon from Virgo, there is this conversation of what am I carrying forward, right? I'm about to wake up from the lands of the dead. I'm about to step my last step out of the lands of the dead and into the lands of the living. What am I carrying with me? What am I bringing with me into this next go around the sun? I'm the crone and I'm purposefully choosing to forget some stuff. I'm purposefully choosing to let go of some information, right? To empty out space into whatever comes for whatever is coming next. What is my process around that? What am I doing with that? What am I carrying? What am I letting go of? All of that. That's really the challenge of this, um, of this, uh, Virgo, Virgo full moon for sure. And that's the work that we are doing in those last hours of winter before we head into spring. And it's okay, we're here. Let's go. Let's make it. Let's do it. Let's embody it. Let's manifest it. Woo, 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 woo. That thing, right? Take these last hours of winter and use them because they're going to be gone so much faster than you think. Truly. Okay. What else do we have? Then we move into our Aries new moon. And our full moon in Libra. At the infant's new moon, these moon names came from come from Raven Caldero's Moon Phase Astrology. I talk about it every week in the podcast. I freaking love this book. It is really cool to work with. I like it a lot. I want you to do this. This is your homework for the Aries new moon in two weeks from now. I want you to write down five challenges that you would like to achieve this year. And when I say challenge, I mean something that feels challenging. Now that could be physical world stuff, but it just as easily could be psychological world, emotional world, spiritual world. You know, you know where you need to challenge yourself. You know what bodies in you need a good shakeup and need a good mountain to try to run up to the top of. This does not have to be about achieving money or achieving awards or achieving recognition in the world. This is about something that feels challenging to you that you want to try to overcome this year. That's a really good Aries vision moment. And then two weeks after that, way out at the, in the middle of April, <laughs> uh, we will have our full moon in Libra and that's our artist's moon. And this, the homework for that is that I encourage you to journal on the relationships between artist as creator and goddess as creator or just make some art now why that though why focus on artist as creator creator as artist well because i said so no <laughs> because we're going to scooch past the rest of the astrology it's in the book um, we're going to talk about some of it in the podcasts coming up in the next couple of weeks but we're going to move into the tarot because Here at the beginning of Ostara season, as much as we are stepping into this maiden energy, right? Gender aside, forget about gender. Don't worry about that. We're stepping into this maiden energy that is curious, naive, silly, playful, adventurous, um, experimental, uh, exploratory, all of that stuff. We are also stepping into our Aries energy. And Aries is represented by the card, the Emperor in tarot, 
ruled by the planet Mars, which is ruled by or connected to the planet or the card, the tower, excuse me. We're almost done. <laughs> and the emperor is an author. The emperor writes the world into being. Think of magical symbolism or magical phrases like the word in the beginning was the word. Ever heard of that? <laughs> Vaguely familiar, perhaps? Well, who wrote the word? The author, right? Capital T, capital A, the author. Who builds the world? The architect. And that character, those archetypes, the architect, the author, the artist, all A words, right? <laughs> all here at Aries and embraced in the emperor. And uh, the tarot cards that we're looking at here are from the builders of the Adidam deck. Big fan. If you've ever taken one of my classes, you know that I'm a huge fan of this deck. You have to paint it yourself, which is part of why it's so incredible. Um, but we see the, the emperor sitting here. Now note the shape of his feet. Note the shape of his legs here, crossed like that. Um, to me, that's vaguely similar to uh, the leg shape that we see in the hanged one and also the shape that is made by the Pisces constellation. Um, but what I think is the most important thing about this uh, Aries card, this emperor card from this deck in particular, is that they have their head turned to the side. And that's because... There are parts of this process that we can know on the conscious level, and there are parts of this process that we can never know. We can't look at it directly. We have to have faith in it. We have to believe that it's happening. But we also have to believe that we have a right to be doing the stuff implied by the emperor, which is why words or archetypal figures like the author, the architect, the adventurer are so important because it really comes into... Um, that place where we begin to embrace, oh, I have a right to build my empire. I have a right to create my world like Kybel, right? <laughs> I can be a world builder too. And I see that, yes, I have to have vision, but I also have to have hope. And I also have to have a little bit of emptiness in me to make so that I have space for whatever this new miraculous thing is that's supposed to come forward. Um, and so all at the same time, I am holding my knowing. I am holding my wisdom in a fashion, right? Uh, but I'm also sitting here with all of that power and capacity in me with a pen in my hand and a blank page in front of me. What am I about to do? And this is why our moon work of engaging and making some art and really thinking about that relationship of artist as creator, creator as artist, artist as God, God as artist, is so important because we are the artist, we are the architect, we are the author. And it is time for us to step up and take responsibility in that way of, oh yeah, I'm, I'm responsible for building this world too, yes I am. And also, while I have all of these incredible skills, I am clearing some things out in me so that I can have room for whatever comes next. Now, why do we have this incredibly cheerful card, the tower here in the mix? What do we do with that, right? All of that sounds very nice when we're looking at the emperor, but then we look over <laughs> next to it, it's like, Bam! but in the meantime, uh, the world is on fire. <laughs> and yeah, it is. It's always been on fire. Not, not that that's good, but that's a thing that we do as a species. <laughs> we always kind of have calamity <laughs> nearby. Uh, and we still have to approach life with this determination. That's what's up. That, in fact, might be where the hope comes in. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> right? Fuck. Wait, in embracing my capacity and my power and embracing what I don't know about the future is where my strength comes in. Okay, wow, that's kind of screwy. And knowing that the world is on fire and it is calamity around me is where I'm actually supposed to hit the drum of hope. Okay, 
that's not that's not fair <laughs> and yet that's witchcraft so you're welcome okay <laughs> uh but how do we deal with this in the pragmatic sense when we're dealing with the tower what are we doing the tower is showing that a part of this process is we need to let go of our ego and that is coming back to that place where the crone is saying the crown that i wear is my wisdom the crown that i wear is my knowledge, my lived experience. That's the crown that I get to wear. And at spring, at Ostara, we are saying, I am knocking that crown off. I'm taking that crown off my head. That thing that has been powerful for me, I'm purposefully letting it go to bring in some shocking new revelation. And if our lived experience is something that we wield in our friend group, <laughs> it can feel really weird to step into a place of unknowing and to step back into or forward into, um, I don't know, I'm just a goofy person like you are. Um, and even if we do make that step uh, into that place, the people around us may still see us as emperors and world builders and leaders and authors and architects and adventurers and artists, even if we're trying to just destroy ourselves and you know let me just try to have a super breakdown of my ego and you know redefine myself it's no big deal <laughs> um but yeah our ego can get super duper woven up into all of that stuff right i hope that makes sense um and the tower card is saying this is a moment where i can hit you know the universe is like i can hit the reset button on that for you if you need me to <laughs> like, are you a little too full of yourself let me help you <laughs> let me knock you down a couple pegs um and, and the blessing of that is that we get to start over here at spring and go, that tower was faulty anyways. That wasn't going to get me anywhere anyways. It wasn't going to get me where I actually needed to go. Um, it, and so at some point it was only going to be a hindrance to me. Okay. There's a few other things I want to talk about. Um, we've got ritual forms. We've got this stuff. But I am going to go to this. Yeah. Okay. So I want to show you this. That is a Naru's altar. Uh, you can see the bright red egg front and center. Sun right dead in the middle. Um, some growing grass, some wheat grass in the background. So baby grass growing right there on the altar. Lots and lots of symbolism for, for that holiday or for this holiday. Uh, this is the Orphic egg. Um, and I'm going to talk about eggs for just a second because we're going to lead into something pretty potent here. Okay, so we don't know when or why humans started to dye eggs, but currently we can trace the practices back to South Africans etching and staining ostrich eggs over 66,000 years ago. It's actually approximately 77,000 BCE is when we first found that humans were scratching designs onto eggs and dyeing eggs. And a common motif found on the eggs was a cross hatching pattern. So before we before I get into before I get into all of that, when we're talking about the egg symbol here at Ostara, we're talking about the Orphic egg. Here it is wrapped uh, three and a half times um, with uh, by a serpent um, and serpent symbolism ties very deeply into our Pisces symbolism and our end of winter beginning of spring symbolism the serpent is one of the oldest goddess uh, images right um, I believe today is March 17th and there's some asshole in Ireland claiming that he's chasing all of the serpents out of Ireland remember that one yeah uh, there were no serpents in Ireland <laughs> and there were priests before and after St. Patrick. He didn't do shit. <laughs> Let me be extremely clear about that. <laughs> but we know that the serpent is a, is a symbol for the goddess. Uh, in fact, one of the great goddesses of the world, Tiamat, is a serpent goddess and she holds the world in her coils she is the order or the boundary and outside of it is chaos and the unknown and inside of her coils is where reality takes place oh right up until marduk killed her and so now we have uh 
well, we have this. So thanks, Marduk, um, for, you know, 2022. It's been great. Thanks, Marduk. Okay, back to the egg. So we have this serpent goddess uh, wrapped around this egg, basically. And we have the serpent and the egg as this symbol of the goddess and returning life and right, life renewed and immortality and all of this great stuff. Um, the egg idea and the egg shape is something that people have worked with for thousands of years. This is Hildegard of Bingen's cosmic egg uh, illustration. Whacked out Christian mystic. Go check out her artwork if you are not familiar. Hildegard of Bingen. Amazing. Um, and humans have been obsessed with eggs for a really long time. Uh, we talked a lot about this in the last in last year's class, so I'm going to skip through these to get to something that I want to point to. One, here, look at these wheel designs at the top of this egg. Doesn't that look a little familiar? Hmm, interesting. Okay. But here, this, the Deep Kloof Rock Shelter, approximately 77,000 years ago. This is in South uh, Africa. And um, these are bits of egg shell that were dyed uh, it was whole at the time they were dyed and they were etched and so this idea of etchings and dying eggs incredibly old um we don't know exactly why they were doing it uh, because of course there are no records but um coming forward several thousand years to modern era dying eggs and using these incredibly beautiful and complicated patterns still popular today in central and eastern europe this is called pasanki um, and this is a really cool egg dyeing uh, and staining and etching tradition. Now, I want you to notice the cross hatching patterns that we see here. And we can already see some in these guys. Even closer, here's some co colors that are very common in Pasanki. These are certainly not the only colors used, but they're the most common. And we see them uh, matching up with, the, with stuff that's pretty normal in witchcraft and paganism, right? Here's an interesting one. Now, this wave line, which kind of looks like water, kind of looks like a serpent, uh, with an eight-pointed star in the middle. Hello. This is called a meander. Note those lines behind the meander. This, this cross-hatching pattern, these are called rochetto. What? <laughs> Haven't we said that word several times in this class to mean a woven sieve slash hand drum that I think might have been played like sh -ch 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 across. Okay, well, then what do we have here? Traditional Pasenki designs, depiction of Rochetto and Barahenia patterns. The Rochetto, the Barahenia is the figure that is, there is a goddess, uh, which I'll show you here in just another one in just a second, uh, named Barahenia for Slavics. Um, this is her. And this is her face depicted in this rochetto or crosshatch pattern. Here is another. This is the Slavic goddess Mati Zirazemlaya, the wet mother earth. Kind of like a bog. And here is another picture of Barahenia. Now, notice on both of these, one, two, three, four, five, six limbs, and then we have this crosshatching. Six curls at the top, six curls at the bottom. And again, six limbs and sort of this oval shape, like very sharp oval shape here in the middle. Life, death, rain, and fertility. All things that we are dealing with here at spring. Another picture of this. And this is, we see those six limbs. This is very specifically a fish shape here and this is a beetle pattern but also pronounced chuki chuk 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 right okay now um these patterns uh depict this goddess of life and death rain fertility we see her depicted with two four or six arms outstretched they are often called chuki which means beetle because the six-armed goddess looks like the Cyrillic letter for ZH. This image is fairly similar to the symbol Chai the Catholic Church uses to represent Christ, also known for his fishy symbolism, right? Because we're in the Piscean era. The Piscean era, fishy, 
fishy fish. Now, I love also that we have this watery business connected to a beetle, because we also know from our esoteric studies, that stuff we talk about in other classes, that the beetle and the scarab are connected to cancer and the moon and water. <laughs> now, uh, what I think is extremely interesting here um, is that the, we have that cross-hatching pattern called Reschetto. Let me show that to you again. Here we see some of it. Here uh, on her face we see a lot of it. These could also very much be um, uh, literally agricultural patterns, like literally looking at the lines in farmland uh, is possibly what this uh, cross-hatching pattern represents. Um, now this cross-hatching pattern, again, called a reschetto, which means a sieve, dates back to Paleolithic times a reschetto is also a Ukrainian folk instrument. In ancient times, it was a wooden ring hit with a stick called a sieve. Later, a screen made of fish or goat skin was woven over it, played like a hand drum. Ch -ch -ch. Okay. And then we have our ch -ch sound here. Now, note this. We have this again from our... Latin, Greek, Roman <laughs> ancestors, Alpha Omega, as this deity symbol, ch -ch -ch -ch, connecting with our ch -ch -ch chuggy beetle pattern, which is Verahania, this goddess of wet, fishy goodness at this time of year. But is that all? No, because this is the first letter of the goddess Tiamat's name. <laughs> <laughs> Here is her full name. Note the crosshatch. Note this star. Now think of the wheels on the uh, chariot. Is it just me? Is it just me? <laughs> is it just me? <laughs> I'm sure it's just a coincidence, as we like to say. <laughs> I love it. Now, again, I'm just some crazy lady on the internet. Have I actually, like, stumbled onto something here? I don't know. Um, do a bunch of other people already know about this and I'm the last person to the party? Maybe. I, you know, uh, am I completely wrong? Maybe. But I think it's very, very interesting that we see these symbols, these practices, these names, these words, these gods, these goddesses all together lumped up doing the same stuff at the same time in the same place for the same reasons. So, kind of interesting stuff. <laughs> Right? I, you should have seen me the first time that I... I mean, it was like four in the morning, madhouse, waking up my roommate at the time. Like, look at this! Look at this with me! Like, <laughs> I've lost my mind! <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so many more things I could say about it. But you know what? I'm just going to leave it. We're going to go on to this. Our ritual forms. Uh, in closing, right? It's F, it's five after. Let me let you guys go here in just a minute. Honoring young people in rites of passage, beginning projects in the physical world. We used in bulk season to get blueprints and plans together. We maybe still need to do some of that in Ostara season. That's okay. But this is also now the time to start making moves in the physical world. Preparing the garden, literally or figuratively, and planting the seeds, again, literally or figuratively. Dyeing eggs, flower divination, this is one of my favorite things about Ostara. This is literally go outside and pick flowers and then bring them home and look them up and see what they're all about. Uh, wandering through nature, I say that in every single class, I will always recommend going and spending time in nature as a means of um, bringing in the energy of the season. Potlucks bonfires, sex and sensuality, whatever that means for you, spring cleaning and new clothes, whatever that means for you, bartering and trading for new clothes counts just as much as paying for them. Uh, I really don't care how you get them, honestly. Uh, symbols that we can work with in our house, we can wear this stuff, we can eat stuff, we can put it on our altars, we can use it in art, whatever. All of these things are completely appropriate. And we've got lots of other um, helpers here. I'm going to scooch through these really super quick. Um, but these are all things that are going to assist in tuning into that Aries energy and the Ostara energy. But here are your meditations for the season. And I recommend using these in a ritual. But um, you can also just have them in a journal 
and have them ready to go for whenever you're feeling like sitting down and talking to yourself about the energy of this season. You are rebirthing after winter's sleep. In the name of the youth, see a vision of potential and possibility. What is that vision? And again, I want to remind you, hope. It's like one of the most powerful pieces of magic you could possibly bring into your practice right now. It's really subversive, honestly. The systems of the world, the bureaucratic, old, decrepit, calcified systems of the world are depending on you not engaging your hope, but staying in fear and scarcity. Hope. Fuck with them. You know what I'm saying? The passions of love and fear can run deep in us. How can we find a balance between light and dark? Very much in the same business, right? How can I deal with this fear and this sadness that maybe I'm holding as I'm looking into the future and trying to clear space for whatever is coming? How do I do that? And finally, you are earth, air, fire, water, and spirit. See yourself as a balanced being and write a letter to yourself from that place. I hope that you have uh, enjoyed this wild ass romp <laughs> through Ostara and Spring Equinox symbolism and myth and magical work that we can do. Um, I truly believe that we have a responsibility as witches and pagans on this earth to wake up the people around us, to shake them out of the illusions that have been cast on them, to dispel the glamour that has been, um, you know, blanketing our friends and our family and our communities. Uh, that glamour is built on the idea that everything is hopeless and uh, there's no future and there's no point in trying for something better. But y we know that that's a lie. Um, we know that's a lie. So our job as pagans in our community, of course, is to do our own work and to take care of ourselves and to pull ourselves out of things when it's not responsible for us to be involved in it. Um, we can't work ourselves to death. We can't only fill our cup with other people's problems. Um, so part of our work is also our self-care. Part of our work is also being responsible around our personal boundaries, saying no when it's time to say no and saying yes when it's time to say yes. But also part of our work is holding our people accountable to their intellectual cynicism, holding our people accountable when they are refusing to engage in their hope and not shutting down their fear, not shutting down their scarcity. It's real. It's completely real and reasonable to be scared right now and to feel like things are scarce and precious. They kind of are. And it is scary. We don't summon hope when things are okay. We summon hope when things are not okay. <laughs> and things are kind of not okay on earth right now. So our job as witches, pagans, motherfucking weirdos, <laughs> queers, aliens, interdimensional creatures, our job is to shake our people out of their fear and out of their cynicism and wake them back up to their power that they hold in their hope and their vision of the future. We need all of it. We need all of it. I hope that carries you through, my friends. Take care of yourselves. Blessed be.